I want to start by thanking a couple of people who've made this night possible. It's absolutely amazing to see our community in this kind of family gathering format, and I just want to give it up to Josh Jardine. He's done a great job. I also want to appreciate Amy Margulis and the Oregon Cannabis Association. One of the amazing reasons we're all together and have been together through one of the most tumultuous times in the city's history, and it's a remarkable time to be here. But there's a couple of things I really want to share with you. A lot of people may not be aware of the Open Cannabis Project. And this is something that I think affects everybody because I, I feel like in some regards, you know, we have to drive a car. We have to build the car that we're driving. We have to lay the race course and the kind of terrain ahead. We have to actually navigate the, the rules that will be affecting the judgment and evaluation of all those things. We have to do all of this simultaneously. But there's a limiting factor in our industry that became very clear over the last two years that I'm trying to work on with a lot more focus and altruistic intent because it, it feels like where a lot of the heart is for me right now. But it's actually having to do with the genetic space and what's been going on with patents. So to end this night with a talk on intellectual property, I'll try to make it brief, it's a little bit brutal because this is maybe the least fun subject, but I do want to give you a little bit of the lay of the land. There are some variables that are changing right now and it's, it's fascinating, but okay, let's get focused. <laughs> so in 2015, the US Patent and Trade Office issued the first utility plant patent. A utility plant patent is one of four kinds of patents that can actually be applied to cannabis. A utility plant patent is an incredibly broad patent. So what that means is it applies not just to a particular plant that's clonally propagated and maybe the work of a long-term breeder who's carefully selecting plants over decades and, and finding something really unique, but in fact it is a category. So the exact language in the first utility plant patent was that any plant over 3% THC and 3% CBD that had the absence of the sedative terpene beta myrcene was what this utility plant patent marked out. Thankfully, because of an incredible chemist in Portland, um, Pat Marshall, who was doing work since the late 90s in a very articulate way, and I was in my own experimental growing doing lots of lab results with him, I was able to find that a canatonic plant I've been working with actually meets that quality exactly. I have less than three milligrams beta myrcene and I have also over 3% THC and CBD. So this is a demonstration of prior art and the fact that this plant existed widely in the world. And in fact, actually, I can manipulate the chemotype of that same plant by letting it grow longer, by changing the light intensity and spectrum, by affecting the fertilizer, probably at root by working with my intention, but maybe I haven't quite got that far down the path. But the reality is this one chemotype, which I have a lab result for, would actually illustrate that the patent that they've applied for, which they suggest is original work based on their own breeding and is kind of a miraculous and unique outcome in the world, is not so. So let me take another step here and describe these categories of patents a little bit further. Behind the utility plant patent, which is by far the most expensive, most onerous, and most broadly applied, they also have plant patents. Plant patents are a lot more narrow. They're targeted towards an individual cultivar that can't be clonally propagated. And these are going to be coming forward for sure. Um, those are the two most important categories. Those are both the ones issued by the US Patent and Trade Office. But there is also another category which the USDA administers um, called the Plant Variety Protection Act. This is the weakest of protections in the patent space around plants and the one that's probably also the most affordable to apply for, um, but very limited protections. So going back to the utility plant patent, what's significant is that if you look at the genomic space of cannabis, which is incredibly broad actually, you know, the distance between a human and a chimpanzee would sort of demonstrate about the amount of genetic range in the family of cannabis plants at this point. So it's an incredibly diverse genot genotype. And the, this really, in part comes from just this long-standing relationship between humans and this ancient plant. The fact that it's moved all around the planet, that it's been used for spiritual and therapeutic purposes. So 
since before the beginning of civilization, that it's really this ancient force that we continue to grow with. But as a result, it's been distributed around the world and evolved in all sorts of niches and unique and distinctive expressions. Although, never so much as in the last 40 years on the West Coast, in careful hands. Really, and compared to the last 10,000 years, the plant evolved more in the last 40 years. And one of the most amazing things was that through our careful selection, through our community caring for sort of qualitative values that weren't purely bottom line, but also following kind of ephemeral attributes, we were able to find a huge amount of polyphonic ter terpenophenolic profiles. We were able to make the nose smell like everything from chocolate to red wine to a huge array of other things. But that's the work of a lot of breeders that really also will never be sort of acknowledged in a financial sense. They won't be remunerated for that work. But all of that work should be in the public domain. The public domain is this idea that anything that was in the market for a year or more already then would be in the public domain and therefore not able to be patented. So one of the issues with the US Patent and Trade Office going forward and issuing this utility plant patent, which is already being followed up by many other applications, is that they simply had no way to measure the public domain. There was no ability for them to go into the records like any other horticultural block and say, well, in fact, this absent beta myrcene one-to-one chemotype two plant did exist, and clearly it was in Jeremy Plum's garden and Nucleus Nurseries in Portland, Oregon, and they didn't have that data. So the amazing thing that the Open Cannabis Project is doing is curating the largest genotypic database in the world, which already exists right now online. Anybody can get access to 100% of Phylos Biosynthesis data, who were the first to donate more than 2,000 samples. Their entire collection of genetic sequence data is online. But further, this year we're going to acquire through aggregators all kinds of lab analytics and throw in the chemotype data so that there is this public domain which is clearly defined, which works to protect all of the lineage of the people that we stand on the shoulders of, the masters who come before us and given us this incredible plant diversity. Because I believe that actually the most important thing going forward for our micro industry and our boutique and craft spirit for the care and the love that we have and share everybody in this room for this plant is actually contingent on our ability to protect the diversity of this plant that it's actually the most important variable. If I was to die and be gone in a couple of years, I would want to know that everybody long after me could continue to pursue a relationship with all of the expressions and iterations of this diverse plan. And this is how the folk medicine revolution really launches. I do think we're at the precipice of a real folk medicine revolution that goes beyond cannabis culture into serving all of the people who are the most at need. The people that are the sick, the poor, and the dying, nationally and internationally, stand to have their quality of life absolutely transformed. But only if local producers and this whole ecosystem that will kind of spawn up around us internationally still have access to the fundamental tools in this revolution. If one company can go forward and own a kind of utility plant patent or a series of utility plant patents, as in the case of this one particular company, then we'll start to see a huge amount, especially of the therapeutically active aspects of the cannabis genome blocked out. That is unacceptable. We will not let that happen. And in fact, this data will be used as defensive intellectual property. We will be able to go to court with this data if need be. It's very expensive to get a utility plant patent. It's also very expensive to enforce it. The reality is there's still a lot that's not known and a, a lot of problems that will come up in this sort of, um, in this direction that we're aiming at, but we've grown a team. If you go to the website, opencannabisproject.org, you'll find an incredible uh, list of board of directors, including Rick Doblin and many others who are real long-term elders in the sort of psychedelic science and cannabis science community. And a lot of people have aligned on this as a really important goal. And I'm absolutely honored to be the executive director of the Open Cannabis Project. So that said, one thing that I would like to offer all the producers in the room is that, you know, in general, people are reluctant to have their plants genotyped. 
But this is a service now, not only through Phyllis Bioscience, but others, but they are our local great science resource and absolutely who I'd recommend going to. It's important to get your plants genotyped because this does not allow, this doesn't help you to get a patent. It prevents others from getting patents. This is the only means we have at this juncture to kind of absolutely document the work that you have and the unique cultivars in your ecosystem. And there's a lot of concern amongst growers that Phylos or that another science entity will somehow be able to tissue culture and propagate their special work. But when you're taking a sample of DNA, I guarantee you nobody is sophisticated enough at this juncture to propagate from the DNA an original version of your cultivar. It's only a means of protecting it getting it into the public domain, and it's very important that the special things and the diverse things get in there because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This was not something afforded a lot of other industries and other plants in horticulture space, and we have an absolutely unprecedented opportunity to protect for all time the diversity of this plant. Please support by genotyping your work and then checking out the website. There's an opportunity to make donations. We're a nonprofit. It's a humble and modest effort that needs a lot of strength going forward, so Please consider giving your support to that. I would like to put on one more hat for the evening, um, just before I wind down here. I, I have to mention that we're coming up on the second annual Cultivation Classic. This is an event that's happening in corroboration with the Willamette Week and Steph Barnhart that is going to be at Revolution Hall on May 12th. This is the most science-forward cannabis event that has ever happened on the planet. We have Cascadia doing full terpene profiles for all entrants. The winners are all genotyped. I, as a part of the Resource Innovation Institute and my advisory role on the Technical Advisory Committee, authored the very first carbon footprint analysis tool. The data that is created by virtue of all of the producers who are willing to slog through a 14-page assay of Kind of really intimate, detailed information will then be used as a lever to even go into California and many other places to say, here are accurate baselines for indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, for water consumption, for energy, to actually have something meaningful to go into the fray around the energy policy dialogue that's coming up that's going to be one of the most important things for us to get right, to not become an energy hog at the advent of you know, the most critical moment of climate change and, and to inherit this you know, unique opportunity to do better. It, it's also the exact same moment that industry is coming on, unfortunately, with a pretty heavy power needs. So we know that we can do better, but the only way is through sharing data. And so this event is actually going to be this factory for an incredibly intimate and detailed kind of data, but it's also gonna be a showcase for some really bright thought leaders. People like Dr. A.D. Poe, who is leading the most incredible qualitative patient data-driven effort that's, I believe, on the planet at this juncture called Habu Health. Um, people like Dr. Ethan Russo and many, many others. We're working to build cannabis community along the West Coast. We have Kevin Jodry, the founder of the Golden Tarp Awards. We have Tim Blake and his partners from the Emerald Cup. We have Dominic Corva um, from Seattle and the Cannabis Policy Institute. So we've got a lot of team building that's going on that it would be really a great joy to have you there if you haven't considered it. I know it will sell out and it would be an honor to have our family well represented. That said, it's absolutely amazing to be here. It's amazing to be in this homecoming, to actually get to share moments with so much friends and family. I hope you all have an absolutely wonderful evening. It's an honor to be with you tonight. Thank you. Association, you can go to orcannabisassociation.org. Thank you.